enumerated the muscles and realizing that all these muscles are likely to be paralyzed in a patient with a complete high radial nerve paralysis, we must test these muscles individually. And it is also recommended that in, in a given patient, you first demonstrate how you want to test these muscles individually on the normal side first so that the patient understands what is expected of him. So since we have already elucidated in the beginning that this is a normal volunteer and not a patient, we will start with the demonstration of the individual muscles. So as far as the triceps brachii is concerned, it can be demonstrated easily by, by allowing rotation at the shoulder and asking the patient to extend the elbow. So this movement, since it is occurring against gravity, it demonstrates that the triceps brachii is at least grade 3. So it is a good policy to start with the muscle acting against gravity and thereafter you can apply resistance. Try to apply resistance in the proximal forearm, not here, because some of the patients may be having a, a not a normal triceps brachii but grade 4. So if you apply resistance here, it may be too powerful a resistance. So you can start with resistance in the proximal forearm dorsal aspect and try to assess what is the power. So this is triceps brachii being demonstrated and for your information, usually this muscle is spared even in the high radial nerve paralysis, which is based on the anatomical fact, anatomical peculiarity of the branches of the radial nerve, which are usually given proximally to the muscle. So usually the, so the, the branch to the triceps brachii would be given high up in the axilla and that is why it gets spared even in those patients who have fracture shaft of the humerus with a radial nerve paralysis. Thereafter, the next muscle to be tested is the brachioradialis and the if you know the action of brachioradialis, it is a flexor of the elbow with the forearm in mid prone position. So the first step is place the forearm in the mid prone position and thereafter ask the patient to flex the elbow. Once he flexes the elbow, a little, a little pressure or a little resistance can be applied in case he is able to flex the elbow in this position and the muscle is, this is the muscle which is contracting and if you want me to mark it, the, the video can pick it up. So this muscle, this muscle here is the muscle which is the brachioradialis muscle. So again, you can see it's beautifully demonstrated. The muscle contracting here is the brachioradialis muscle. Next muscle to be tested is the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. For the information of the candidates, it is difficult to test these two muscles in isolation. So we usually test these muscles together. So ECRL and ECRB are to be tested together. And the maneuver which the patient needs to perform first on the normal side is that you ask the patient to make a fist, make a fist, and then you position your finger in such a way that the patient has to dorsiflex as well as radially deviate 
radially deviate. So this is the maneuver that the patient needs to do. And to make things better, I think we can uh, move the forearm a little on this side so that the camera can pick it better. So you position your finger in space so that to touch your finger, the patient has to dorsiflex and radially deviate. And then you can apply a resistance. And if you want to palpate, you can palpate the, the tendons somewhere just proximal to the base of the second and third metacarpal. And this is how the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis can be demonstrated. In all those cases where the contraction is weak, it is advisable to palpate the muscle contraction in the proximal forearm for demonstrable contraction. Remember, patients may use strict movement and the golden dictum is analysis of movement is not analysis of power. So remember that and try to palpate the muscle belly whenever in doubt. Hereafter, we can embark upon testing the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle, which is by virtue of its insertion on the ulnar aspect into the base of the fifth metacarpal, it is an extensor of the wrist and an ulnar deviator of the wrist also. So here again, you position your finger in a place in space where the patient will have to dorsiflex as well as ulnarly deviate the wrist to touch your finger. And the muscle can be palpated or the tendon can be palpated just proximal to the base of the fifth metacarpal. It's a, it's a, it's a very strong tendon easily palpated like a cord which gets taut on dorsiflexion. Again, when in doubt, move proximally and palpate the muscle belly. So once we have demonstrated the three wrist extensors, we can now demonstrate the action of the extensor digitorum communis muscle, which is an extensor of the digits. Now here, the common pitfall is that when the patient has a wrist drop deformity, the digits, they usually passively undergo an extension. So you just watch this. I, I'm, the pa I'm not asking the patient to do anything, but the moment I, I passively flex the wrist, the fingers go into extension. And when I dorsiflex passively, the fingers, they tend to flex. So this is the tenodesis effect which is coming into, into force. On flexion of the wrist, it is the extensor digitorum tenodesis. And on extension of the wrist, it is the long flexor tenodesis which creates flexion of the wrist. So the corollary here is if you have to test for active digital extension, try to support the wrist in neutral position or slightly dorsiflex position. And then you ask the patient to extend the digits. And if the, if the, if the extensor digitorum communis is paralyzed, the patient will not be able to extend the digits from this level because we are taking away his ability to bring in the phenomenon of tenodesis, extensor tenodesis here. Well, the same is the story when you are trying to demonstrate the action of the extensor pollicis longus. Patients who have a wrist of deformity, I'll demonstrate on the other side for better clarity. So patients who have a wrist drop deformity, they usually, the extensor pollicis longus 
creates a passive extension of the distal interferential joint. The moment you, play, you place the wrist in dorsiflexion or you passively hold it in that, actively hold it in that position and then you ask the patient to extend the digit. If the extensor pollicis longus is paralyzed, he will not be able to extend the digit. So these are the pitfalls and how to overcome the pitfalls when you are examining a case of radial nerve paralysis specifically for testing the muscles which are involved. Lastly, to complete the examination, we also need to test for the sensory area of supply of the radial nerve and by our knowledge of anatomy, we know that it is supplying this particular area, this particular area which is the first, the skin of the first dorsal web space. So this shaded area is the area which is supplied by the radial nerve. Well, students, again there is a pitfall which needs to be which needs to be uh, taken care of and that is commonly when you ask the patient can he feel in this area can he feel in the affected area he will always tell you yes he can feel but the true depiction of sensory alteration will come in if you first touch the normal side skin in the identical area and you tell him that supposing this is 100%, can you tell me whether it is same hair or it feels different? And the patient, if, this, if there is a sensory deficit, he will tell you that though he can feel, it is not feeling the same intensity as on the normal side. And that is the trick lies in comparison. Always compare sensation with identical area on the normal side. I think with this, we have demonstrated what all motor as well as the sensory examination is to be performed in a given case of radial nerve paralysis. High radial nerve has been demonstrated and in a low radial nerve paralysis you can derive from this description itself. Thank you.